on behalf of RBCS, RBCS New Zealand, RBCS Australia, Software Test Works, and Software Test Professionals, we welcome everyone today to this webinar on 10 lessons in test outsourcing. I am Rex Black, President of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, RBCS has been both a pioneer and leader in quality hardware and software testing. We have offices in the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and Sri Lanka with partners around the world. RBCS delivers insight and confidence to our clients, helping them get quality software and hardware products to market on time and with a measurable return on investment. We have a team of international consultants that deliver customized training, consulting, and outsourcing services for companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. RBCS has helped hundreds of companies reduce development and support costs while assuring the best quality products are delivered to customers. I'm the author of Pragmatic Software Testing, Advanced Software Testing Volumes 1, 2, and soon to be 3, Foundations of Software Testing, Critical Testing Processes, and Managing the Testing Process. I hold a degree in Computer Science and Engineering from UCLA. I'm also past president of the International Software Testing Qualifications Board and the American Software Testing Qualifications Board. RBCS is presenting this webinar today in partnership with Software Test Professionals, the producer of Software Test Professionals Conference 2011. This will be held March 22nd through March 24th. If you'd like to learn more about the conference, visit www.stpcon.com. If you haven't visited their association website, make sure you check it out as well, www.softwaretestpro.com. That's Software Test Pro all one word. As a special incentive for attending today's webinar, STP is giving a $200 discount to their conference. When you register to attend, use the following code, STP11WEB. Code again, STP11WEB. $200 discount is not combinable with other offers. Now, before we start the presentation, some housekeeping notes. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, feel free to submit them at any time during the presentation via your webinar interface, a special questions box that you can use for that. There is no need to ask for presentation copies. The presentation is already posted on the web, www.rbcs-us.com. You can find that on the basic library. There's also no need to ask about how to register for the free e-learning drawing. Just by attending this webinar, you have automatically been registered to win free e-learning. Check your email over the next couple days. Watch the spam filter to make sure that the notification doesn't get lost there. You will have a limited amount of time to respond if you are the winner, so be sure to watch for that. If you are having problems with either the audio or visual components of this webinar, please contact GoToWebinar Support. If for whatever reason you cannot get to the webinar online or if you are dealing with an unreliable internet connection, please download the slides. Again basic library page, www.rbcs-us.com. Look at the resources tab. You'll find the basic library page. And be sure to use the telephone to connect rather than voice over IP. Though, honestly, we haven't had a lot of uh, trouble with that. But if you uh, do have run into that situation, there's your solution. I hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS, we are a not-just-for-profit company. Okay, today's presentation is on 10 lessons in software test outsourcing. Now, I've been involved in test outsourcing for over 20 years now, and I've seen it succeed and I've seen it fail. So what I want to do today is give you some, some lessons that I've learned in 20 plus years. And if you apply these lessons, and we'll discuss here today, you can greatly increase your chances of test outsourcing success. Okay. So here are the 10 lessons. I'll go over these briefly, and then we'll uh, go into each one of them in detail. Um, successful test outsourcing involves each side of the relationship understanding the other side's motivations. Also involves recognizing the various process differences that can exist across the different uh, groups involved and uh, managing those process differences in a uh, uh, proper fashion. You need to select the right type of contractual relationship between the different parties. You need to manage the organizational politics that can um, can come up. Um, regrettably, there's organizational politics in any sort of 
relationship, business relationship, uh, not excluded, and uh, those need to be managed. Um, you need to make sure that you recognize the importance of relevant experience in the outsourced uh, testing services provider. You need to understand the various resource management issues that outsourcing creates. Understand um, implications of using tools. Foresee and proactively manage the security issues that will arise. Make sure that you, again, um, actively and proactively manage the geographical and language issues that will probably come up. And be careful to avoid various kinds of planning and estimation blunders that are all too common in this uh, uh, outsourced testing situations. So let's look at each one of those 10 in more detail. So understand the motivations. Why are you doing this? So. Um, Look at the project, look at the resources, look at the reasons for outsourcing. If you're a client and you're thinking about, I want to outsource some or all of the testing uh, on, on a particular project, why are you doing it? Uh, do you need some trusted testing partner to uh, handle certain work that you think uh, you might not be able to handle in-house? Do you need um, to bring on some extra hands to deal with some staffing shortages that you might have? Um, maybe you need both. Uh, maybe you're needing people with specific skill sets, such as, say, performance testing or security testing. Maybe you're just looking to save money. Um, understand what your motivations are before you go out looking for an outsource testing vendor. Certainly no harm in kicking some tires to find out what people can do out there in the market, and that might um, give you some additional ideas and additional reasons to outsource. But be careful about going forward with any sort of outsourcing engagement. If you're not entirely clear on what your motivations are, as the uh, line goes, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. But the problem is you might not be happy uh, once you get there. Now, another thing that you need to think through in, in relation to this motivational issue is what's the duration of the assignment? Um, is this something where you're going to throw some work uh, over the fence, as it were, to a team to kind of handle it short term and the relationship is not going to be long lasting, or maybe periodic resumptions in the relationship, but in general, you're not looking to tightly integrate them? Or are you looking at a tightly integrated longer term type of uh, relationship? Um, you know, this is going to influence uh, things like should you invest in resources that might be located at the outsource testing provider's site? And we just had a conversation with a client who's looking to outsource some work for us. And one of the things that we were discussing was, you know, what amount of their custom hardware is going to need to be located in our test facilities? So that's something that, uh, that you'll, you'll want to consider in a long-term relationship. Of course, in a short-term relationship, the return on investment is going to be degraded if there's a significant cost associated with getting uh, getting these kinds of resources established at the outsourced uh, test facility. Um, might there be a need to buy or rent special equipment? And this can include things like uh, licenses for test automation tools that might be required. And we'll talk more about tools a little later. But you know, buy versus rent. Um, Obviously, buy implies long-term. Typically, rent would imply shorter term. Uh, security. Well, how much is it going to cost you to implement the various security standards that you might have to have in terms of access to your company data center? Um, it can be relatively costly in some cases, though in other cases it can be quite cheap. Um, but it is something that you need to look at. There is overhead typically associated with getting anybody tied into your corporate network, and um, you need to understand what that, that would be. And also, if there are other applicable standards, then there might be some costs associated with that. For example, some of our clients are in the um, safety critical regulated industries like um, FDA regulated medical devices, and there are a lot of standards that apply to how the test, uh, tests and the traceability between tests and the test basis is the requirements and so forth, and the test results are are captured. And uh, 
So there's a lot of flexibility in how specifically that's done, but the standards say what data must be available, and then different organizations come up with different ways of implementing that, implementing those standards. And that's something that you'll make, you'll need to make sure that your testing service providers are are uh, tied into. Now, you know, if uh, if the relationship is long term, then you want to integrate them fairly closely to that. If the relationship is more short term, you might want to uh, handle some of the um, paperwork requirements, if I can use that phrase, uh, a little more flexibly at the back end with your own staff and use the uh, outsourced testers purely as a raw source of information. I'm not saying that you you want to accept slipshot testing on their part, just saying that you might allow them to submit documentation of their tests and the results in a more lightweight format, which you then transform to comply with your specific implementations of the regulatory standards. So these are all things that need to be considered. Um, none of them uh, need uh, create any sort of major obstacles, but they, uh, if not thought through, um, will uh, uh, make the engagement a lot less uh, effective and efficient. So before you go out to put out an RFP, request for proposal, start taking bids on the work, make sure that you understand exactly what you're looking for. Um, one of the things that uh, we usually uh, talk about with our clients, in fact, we always talk about with our clients at the beginning of any engagement, including outsourcing engagements, is well, what does success look like to you? Let's say that six months, a year down the road, we've we've finished our engagement with you or we've got the ongoing engagement with you and you consider it to be successful, what would that look like? Now, um, process differences. Different organizations tend to do things different ways. So, you know, simple example, um, how do you track defects? When you're running testing, how do you track defects? Uh, different organizations use different tools. Some of those tools are uh, easier or harder to tap into. Um, there's different uh, life cycles often implemented in those tools. And even the same tool can have different life cycles uh, implemented, defect life cycles implemented in it. Um, this is just one of numerous potential process differences that could exist, and most of them don't really matter. Um, you know, I mean, for example, your outsource um, uh, testing services provider will possibly have some sort of, should have some sort of way of tracking the number of hours spent on your projects, and there are various approaches that can be used for that. And and really, you don't care from a uh, client point of view as long as the invoice that's submitted is accurate. Um, so you could have you could be working with three different outsource vendors, each of which tracks their time in completely different fashions, but as long as the invoice that, that comes into your accounts payable people is accurate, then um, what do you care about that? It's an, it's an invisible process difference as long as the work product it creates is, is acceptable. Now, other things, though, um, processes that basically exist across touch points between the vendor and your own organization, those process differences can have uh, significant um, problems can cause significant problems if those differences are not managed. Uh, we've seen uh, tremendous amounts of, of waste and inefficiency associated with these kinds of uh, unresolved process differences. And by the time the project gets going hot and heavy, there isn't any time to resolve them. Though at the beginning of the uh, relationship between the outsourced testing services provider and the client, there was plenty of time to resolve the process problems had they been foreseen. So. Make sure during a uh, planning initiation and, and perhaps even in the in the whole RFP process that you look very carefully at uh, what um, what process differences might exist and which ones would be um, applicable and problematic, and um, you know look at uh, how to solve those problems um, or make sure that at least that, that that's part of the engagement. Now um, the let, let me point out here that I'm talking specifically about outsource um, testing services as a, as a source of, of major difficulties here. When you do um, on-site staff augmentation, this does tend to be less of an issue for obvious reasons. Because I mean, if you're bringing in a dozen people from a outsource testing organization, they're going to work at your site 
with your tools and side by side with your people, the assumption should be that they will follow uh, their process. Uh, follow, excuse me, follow your process, and and uh, and, and thus the, the whole integration of the processes is, is is handled in that fashion. But when you've got an outside testing service provider doing um, work off site, by default they're going to want to follow their own process, and that's that's where the, the issues come up. So in addition to the things I've already mentioned, here's some other things to consider. Um, differences in test strategy. Let's suppose that you use an analytical risk-based testing strategy, um, and the uh, testing service provider is used to following primarily a uh, requirements-based testing strategy, and may maybe your requirements process is not as mature as some of their other clients. Now this, this could create some significant problems because they're going to start jumping up and down saying, well, where's the requirement spec? We need the requirement spec to design the test cases. And you're going to say, well, you're not going to get a requirement spec. What you're going to get is a quality risk item inventory, and you need to develop tests that uh, cover those risks adequately based on the level of risk. And th they won't necessarily know how to do that. Um, so that you know that can be a problem. And by the way, if you're wondering like what's all this stuff about risk-based testing, take a look at the um, RBCS blog and the RBCS basic advanced digital libraries. There's a whole bunch of information out there about risk-based testing. If that's if that's something you're curious on, um, suppose you're following an agile methodology and the testing service provider is more used to working with clients that follow a, a waterfall or a sequential uh, life cycle. That's obviously going to create some integration issues potentially. Um, what if um, the testing service provider is, is used to working with organizations that have achieved a certain capability maturity model level of maturity, say CMMI level four or above, and you're happily operating somewhere between one and two, depending on what day it is, uh, that, that's, um, that's likely to create some, some um, issues, process issues, and communication issues as well. And of course, any sort of unique requirements for your domain. So as I said before, you know, if you're FDA regulated, there are going to be some issues of documentation issues and so forth that you need to attend to, and you'll need your testing service provider to attend to. So make sure you think of that. Now, contractual relationship. I mean, all, you know, we we often use the the phrase partner. You know, we're going to partner with this person. We're going to partner with that one. You know, but I mean, let's get down to brass tacks here. It's a business relationship, and you're purchasing services from the vendor. And so there's a contract involved in that. Um, and so you need to figure out what that con how that contract ought to be, um, ought to be structured. Um, so one option is to use the basic time and materials um, approach, which is you basically pay the client, or pay, excuse me, pay the vendor by the hour, and um, and and on any sort of actual costs uh, um, uh, incurred for materials, or maybe costs some plus some administrative overhead fee for materials and travel and so forth. Now, um, you know this is uh, this is a, a very flexible way to structure your contractual relationship with the vendor because um, you're free to change your mind. Um, Pretty much any time, and um, you know the vendor's happy to go along with any twists and turns that uh, that uh, occur. And this will probably be cheaper if if the, you, as the client, uh, manage your change uh, the, the changes you make carefully, because basically what what's going to happen in time and materials, you're just paying you're paying hourly rate, and 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 the, the vendor is likely to quote you. Um, a, a, a competitive hourly rate in order to try to win the business. Um, they have they are not taking a risk of operating non uh, unprofitably because uh, you're going to pay them by the hour. So, excuse me. So it really uh, doesn't um, it, it doesn't it doesn't behoove them to try to puff up the price because that's going to be immediately obvious if you're doing head-to-head -head comparison across multiple vendors and somebody's way out of line in terms of the price relative to the experience of their people. So you will you will get a cheaper uh, total cost out of a time and materials relationship if, if you manage that relationship carefully, but you will 
you will need to manage it. Now, as an alternative, you can use what's called a fixed bid. So in a fixed bid, what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, I want you to give me a cost, and the total cost uh, for doing a certain piece of work. Now, it requires that the scope be sufficiently clear at the beginning of the, of the relationship such that uh, the, the vendor feels comfortable bidding it. And what's likely to happen is that you're going to pay more for the work because the vendor is going to have to build in certain contingencies. Um, and now it's not necessarily you're going to pay more. In some cases, you might end up paying less, but that's that is not not a, generally a good thing in the long run for reasons I'll get into in just a minute. Now, the the nice thing about a fixed bid, if the scope is clear, is that this does min minimize the budgetary risk for you um, as the as the client. So you're you know the 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 vendor is on the hook to do the work for a certain amount, and they don't they they, they don't get paid more than that unless there's some sort of change request that comes through and has associated costs. Now, you do have to be careful with those change requests because if you do fix bid and then you start making a lot of changes, um, sometimes what will happen is that the vendor will, uh, will really stick it to you on the changes because they'll feel like since you've already started the engagement with them, cost to change vendors would be very high, and therefore they are in a position to really uh, – um, jack up their prices on the changes. So you want to be sure that you know what you're doing, what you're going to be doing before you engage in a fixed bid piece of work. Now, there's another option somewhere in between those two, which is called time and materials not to exceed. And this is basically where you say you're going to pay the vendor time and materials as above, but there's a cap, uh, and they commit to get the work done within the cap. This has the um, the effect of, again, minimizing or at least managing your budgetary risk, but it does also put you in somewhat of a box that the scope has to be clear enough that the vendor is comfortable doing that. And in terms of price, um, you know, the vendor is going to tend to want to put that not to exceed cap as high as they think they can get away with. Um, and, and at the same time, they're going um, to want to uh, um, have change controls built in so that if you do make changes that they can say, hey, I, I, we're going to need more money for that. Now, <clears throat> I'm approaching this discussion of contract from the point of view that the vendor uh, wants the client to be happy and the client wants the vendor to be happy. In other words, it is not, um, it's not a zero-sum game and you're not trying to trip somebody up and, and get them to uh, um, do something that's not in their best interest. The vendor is not trying to rip off the uh, client, and the client is not trying to um, get the vendor to do something at a really low price. Because the thing to keep in mind about this is if, if the vendor feels that they're being, they're being ripped off, that they were gulled in the negotiations and forced to, put, to, to commit to do something, and then and then there's been a lot of bait and switch stuff happening and changes that get pushed back when they say hey, that's a change. What what you'll eventually see is that the quality will start to suffer, and it's very difficult to prevent this. We've seen this happen with with a number of our clients that were using vendors, and they really they you know for whatever reason the vendor felt that they had gotten into a highly disadvantageous situation, and uh, you know they just they they decided well you know. We're, we're going to make the best we can out of this. And they started doing things like putting the most junior people on the engagements and you know, doing shoddy work and uh, arguing with the client a lot. And it really, um, it really, it really creates a lot, of, uh, a lot of pain and sets up a, sets up a failure for both parties. Um, so you know, once, you've, once you've got to the point where you have, have signed a contract with a vendor and they're working on your project, I mean, remember, you're all in the same boat. And shooting holes under somebody else's feet when you're in the same boat just means that their end of the boat sinks faster, but eventually the whole boat sinks. So don't try to um, to rip off the uh, um, rip off the vendor in, unless you you actually don't care whether the project succeeds or not. Now, organizational politics. Um, now, let me let me just say I've given a lot of this presentation from a, from the vendor's point of view, um, 
I want to kind of flip this around for, for a minute and, and talk about, or I mean, from the client's point of view, I'm going to flip this around for a minute and talk about it from the vendor's point of view, what the vendor needs to do. Um, now, just, you know, the, the trend, testing service provider, the, the vendor, their, their internal politics should absolutely positively never affect the client. Um, it is the height of unprofessionalism for any sort of internal politics um, or any kind of negative organizational dynamics that exist within the vendors who to leak across to the client side. When, when that happens, in the unfortunate case that that happens, it engenders an enormous amount of, of uh, unhappiness uh, amongst the clients, managers, and experiences I've seen. And I have seen the most outrageous, inappropriate behaviors time to time from, from vendors. Um, a situation once where people were working on site and uh, those people started to try to engage in the, the employees, the client's employees, in conversations about how much they got paid per hour. Um, just, just completely inappropriate. It, it made, made people very uncomfortable. Built an enormous personal wall up between the, um, the client's employees and the people that were working there on site. You know, the, the impression that uh, any time they come to have a conversation, it's likely to get into some sort of uncomfortable um, area led people to not want to have conversations. So, so this kind of stuff, there, there needs to be a very clear definition of what is appropriate behavior in interfacing with the client and the client's employees. And uh, if you're managing a testing service provider, you need to hold your people to the highest standards on that and do not tolerate any sort of, uh, of misbehavior because it'll, it's your reputation that will suffer if, uh, if people go in there and, and act uh, in, in an inappropriate fashion in any way. Even if they're not in there, they're just interacting over email and so forth. That, that all reflects on the vendor. And you know, from, from, if you're on the client side, I would you know, encourage you to hold your vendors to that rule, say that you you are not going to get sucked into their politics, their organizational dynamics, any of that kind of stuff. Um, and if it starts to happen, then you should escalate that to the highest levels of the um, of the vendors management team and say, look, this is unacceptable. We cannot have you your organization being disruptive in ours. We're paying you to do work, and we expect you to do work without engaging in this kind of behavior. Now, that said, um, this is not a symmetrical relationship. The, the vendor has no right to demand the same of the client. You, you, you know, you are, you as a, as a testing service provider are choosing to engage in uh, work for a client, and that work is going to be done under whatever the prevailing circumstances are for that client. And, you know, some, some organizations have very low level of politics, and they're very placid and undramatic and uh, other organizations there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of drama and there's a lot of change and so forth and that's just part of the deal um, so you know uh, you certainly you need to set up mechanisms that allow you to, to manage the impact of that um, and you need to understand the importance of the, those kinds of impacts so that you know how to get out in front of them and and operate successfully even in such a, a charged environment um, but uh, you know, do not um, do not uh, anticipate that you're going to be able to say, "Look, we don't do business that way. We are a no drama shop." You know, you're going to you know, check your politics at the door. You know, you will you will have some some risk of uh, of getting um, you know, pulled into that. Now, um, <clears throat> various things. I mean, if the politics can be of, of wide variety. I've seen all sorts, but uh, some things that come up not infrequently. Um, client employees perceive the outsource testing service provider as a threat, um, particularly in the case of tight staffing situations. People might be getting laid off or been hiring freezes or salary caps or something. There can be, be that perception. And if so, then you know you're you're likely to find that the the employees, um, well, they'll do what they clearly have to do to support the work on the, the testing service provider side. They will not, in any circumstances, go above and beyond what they are required to do. They'll do the 
they'll do the minimum and they'll do it in, in a way that uh, cannot be construed as sabotaging. Uh, I mean, unless they're just really dumb and they actually do go out and openly try to sabotage the outsourced relationship, which generally puts them in in uh, it puts them at risk of some serious consequences if there's been a strategic decision made to, to use outsourcing. So it does happen sometimes, but more often than not, what you're going to find is smart employees will who, who have started to perceive outsourcing as a threat will simply engage in um, a little little sort of passive aggressive types of moves that undermine the effectiveness of the testing service provider. So. Don't be surprised if you see some of that happen. Um, another thing that can happen is that there can be dependencies on other service providers that end up rippling down and affecting uh, your ability as a as a vendor to get work done. And there's no fair whining about this stuff. And this is, uh, you know, if if let's say that upstream you've got some code that's being built by Accenture and you're working downstream and you're doing the testing and the Accenture guys are continually delivering code that doesn't work and um, you know doing other things that uh, that create problems and I'm just picking Accenture's name out of the hat because they're big I'm not picking on them particularly but you, you're you're really going to have to just understand this and build this into the bid um, you, you, you know the if you it one of the things that, that I've found with, with clients that do a lot of outsourcing to different vendors is that they they hate getting caught in the middle of some sort of um, conflict between the vendors. In fact, there's even a, there's a phrase that you hear amongst CIOs about this, uh, which is one neck to choke. And, and basically what that means is that they, they don't want to be in situations where they get caught in the middle of a conflict between vendors, each of, each of which is trying to blame the other side for all of the problems on the project. And so just be aware that if, if you rightly or wrongly are in a conversation with the client's management and, and you're explaining how another vendor's behaviors impacted your ability to get your work done and therefore you want more money or you need a delay or whatever, just understand that that is, to say that that conversation is likely to be poorly received is, is, is the understatement of the year. Um, the manage, regardless of what they say about this, managers on the, on the receiving end of that conversation will be extremely disappointed the situation and you will be unlikely to avoid some amount of blame um, even if you are entirely blameless. And then finally another uh, political situation is the, um, the issue of uh, hidden agendas. Uh, the person to whom you report uh, on the client side as, as vendor might have um, hidden agendas that they're trying to advance. And um, you know you're, you're uh, you're in a tricky situation here as a vendor. Your job is to serve the needs of your client, um, which is not the same as serving the needs of an individual manager within the client's organization. But, of course, from that individual manager's point of view, they they hold a fair amount of power over you and the relationship, and they're probably going to be uh, feeling like they've got a right to have that power deployed in a or your your work deployed in a way that consistent with their organizational um, motivations. So. Tricky situation, um, you know. The, I guess the, the bottom line for all of these things is that the more that you can avoid getting embroiled in these politics, the better. And to the extent that you can try to stay above them, uh, that's that's also very good. Okay, let's, there we go. Um, <clears throat> slide advanced problem there. Now, the importance of experience. Um, Well, you know, there's no point in being anything less than entirely blunt. A lot of test service providers will usually accept any sort of business that comes along. <laughs> you know, um, oh. excuse me. We uh, we try here at RBCS to avoid that sort of oh yeah sure we can do that that talking our way into work that we can't handle, just because it's inconsistent with one of our uh, basic corporate philosophies, which is only have happy customers. And uh, you know, to the extent that you you accept business that you can't actually do, then um, you're you're not going to um, uh, you know you're not you're not going to perform properly, and then that's the client's unhappy, and you got an unreferenceable client, and so forth. Now, pardon me, a little sip of tea there for my throat. Um, 
I don't want to cast aspersions on our competitors, so I don't want to make blanket statements here, but I will say that it is, it is certainly not unusual to find testing service providers that do not share our level of aversion to work that we're not confident we can handle. Um, the, the, you know, the, the answer is generally yes, and then you know, go and figure out how to do the work. And if you can't, well, then you know, maybe you just kind of figure out a way of making sure there's plenty of blame to go around. Now, I don't want to sound overly cynical, and again, I'm not trying to bash our competitors here, but we've certainly heard that story from more than one um, client. Um, so we need to uh, we need to think about um, about experience levels, um, both not high enough and and too high. Um, now, you know, if we're talking about a short term, simple engagement, and you want to have some real heavy hitters on that, just just because it's high risk, this is this is not going to be a problem. Um, but longer term, um, longer term, this this some issues can arise, um, uh, particularly with the people doing the work. So, you know, let's suppose that you've got a billing system that runs on an IBM mainframe, it's, you know, COBOL software, um, and you've got some people who are working on that and doing the development and, and also doing some testing, say, with another outsource vendor. And, um, you know, it's um, it's not exactly cutting edge. And so after a while, people, the people working on the project, I mean, the, co the company, the vendor is happy to have the business, right? But the people working on the project, the outsourced resource starts to say, well, where exactly is this going for me? Uh, am, I, am I like dead ending my career here with this old technology? Uh, another, another kind of similar situation can arise when you have really monotonous project work going on long term. Like, for example, you, say you decide that some of your, a lot of your regression testing is not automatable, so you're not going to try to automate it. And you, um, you have uh, resources in some other location, some outsource vendor, very cheap, doing all of your manual regression testing. Well, you know that's that's not something that they're likely to, to like very much. Now, there are various things that the vendor can do to try to keep that, get to try to manage the monotony level, but it's still it's a burnout machine, and it's uh, it's going to tend to create some some issues. Um, similarly, um, you know, let's suppose that uh, you've got a um, situation where the the application being tested it's it's just very simple. It doesn't require a lot of skill to test and you know so people feel like oh, this is this is really a boring job. Um, not not very challenging. And so in this case you're gonna have uh, people who um, People in the in the outsource vendor who is going to you know look for different different projects or accounts to work on. Now, um, I've seen this play out in a number of different ways. Right now, the one on the one hand, it can be that the uh, vendor really takes advantage of the client on this, um, and they use these kinds of projects as a sort of a training ground or a, a uh, weeder process, as, as it were, for their um, their staff. They bring people on and they put them on these projects that are really these unglamorous, um, you know, potentially client debt or uh, career debt ending projects. They stick them on these projects for a while and then once they've decided, yeah, this person's a keeper, they pull them off and put them on something that's more quote unquote glamorous or interesting or what have you. Um, and, and this, you know, th th this might be right out in the open with the individuals coming on, you know, and they're told, look, the, the deal you're making here is that you're going to work on this project and you're going to hate every minute of it for the first six months of your your time here. But then you'll go to a project that you like. Um, so they're they're happy to get off and and you know they, they off they go, uh, skipping and running. They're not they're very very little interest in transitioning what they know to somebody else. And now the new person gets thrown on and boom they don't know what they're doing. So in such a situation you are continuously operating at uh, at a your, your actual effective headcount is below the staffing rate um, because everybody's on some sort of ramp up. So that's not fair to the client. 
Um, so a lot of times what we recommend that our, um, that our uh, clients do in these situations is introduce what's called a clawback. And basically what that says is that if somebody leaves um, the project, that the replacement resource has to be free for some amount of time. Now that, that's that's perfectly fine and um, is fair up to a point, uh, but you also have to understand as, as a client that if you've got a project that's not going to be very fulfilling for people, that they're going to want to get off of it. So um, you know, determine what a reasonable compromise is here. Um, because again, this needs to be win-win. It is not in your to your advantage to operate a burnout machine in the vendor side because you know, yeah, people people might. Um, you know, you might you might be able to restrict the vendor's ability to move people around, but ultimately, if people get burnt out. If they have options, they might just go work somewhere else, and then you lose your experienced people anyway. And the clawback, yes, that affects the efficiency, but you know, cost to some extent. But you're still dealing with a situation where you're effectively understaffed. Uh, now, um, resource management. So, you know, testing service provider is obviously going to like to have a, a project that grows in terms of the billable resources. And again, it's it's real hard. And, you know, I know this running a testing service providing company. It's real hard to um, when an existing client comes along and offers you an expansion of the engagement to say, well, you know, we, we don't really think we can handle that. Um, it's it's that comparatively a lot easier actually to walk away from work that. Um, that you know from the outset you can't do because you're, you're just walking yourself into a situation you know that you won't turn out well. But sometimes you get into engagements where you know, no problem initially and then things scale and then you realize, wow, that's, uh, that's kind of a challenge. Now, again, we try to stick to our golden rule here at RBCS, again, in no, no unhappy clients. Um, but, you know, the general tendency, you want your business to grow. Um, but it can that can be a challenge. Um, you know, if the if things grow very rapidly, then uh, the resources required could increase drastically in a short period of time, and that's that can be tough to manage. Um, could potentially create capital issues for the, the testing service provider too. I mean, if you if if you need to go out and purchase a lot of capital equipment, like say you you want to rapidly build up the ability to do. Um, compatibility testing across a large number of PC platforms or browser platforms or something like that, that can be fairly expensive. And if you don't have the uh, you don't have a credit line to do it or the cash in the bank, um, you know, where where are you going to get that equipment from? Um, also the um, the issue of turnover again, you know, you, you would want in and in, in growing projects to have uh, to grow around the core team of the experienced folks, but you know, um, a person might have been uh, reassigned to another project during down period. They could be on vacation. They could have left. Um, so it's really important to um, to manage these things proactively to try to look ahead and see where they're gonna where these issues are gonna pop up. So if they're going to be if the idea is to have an initial relationship as sort of a pilot or proof of concept between the testing service provider and the uh, client with that growing over time, then that growth should be something that's discussed um, at the outset of the relationship. Now, tools. Um, there's usually some amount of test tooling involved uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and you know, obviously, automating um, Test execution can uh, increase the efficiency and let's push up the savings associated with uh, with the whole outsourcing even further. Um, but th this is also, you know, there's potential pitfalls here. Now, some of these are just inherent in automation in general, but others are um, either inherent in or, or exacerbated by the um, outsourced uh, element of, of what we're talking about here. So um, picking the wrong um, tool right out of the gate, um, you know, this it's it's amazing how often this happens. You know, the uh, you, you get things, you get external constraints like our organization already has bought tool X, 
therefore we're going to use tool X. And the whole question of whether tool X is the right tool for the job is taken completely off the table because client management says, nope, nope can't, can't discuss that. Um, you know, okay, well, you, know, you, you can make do, but the, the worst, the, 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 the mismatch between the tool and the problem that needs to be solved, of course, the more, the higher the cost. Um, there's the jumping to conclusions uh, problem. You know, oh, well, we've used this tool in the past. It worked fine. Uh, let's use it again. And this can happen on the vendor side and the client side, um, that either the, the vendor has some tool that there's somebody, you know, within the testing service provider that they just love this tool. And so they're like, oh, yeah, we got to use this tool. And then only afterwards does it turn out, hey, guess what? That's not going to work. Um, or, you know, the client says, well, you know, we've always used Loadrunner here, for example, and so you know, let's let's use Loadrunner again, and even though there might be some freeware uh, out there um, that's that's perfectly suitable. Um, now, on the on the uh, subject of freeware, I mean, just because a tool costs money doesn't mean it's better than a tool that's free. But on the other hand, the the risk of of, um, of freeware is that you get uh, people making decisions where they're you know the kind of people as as Oscar Wilde put it who uh, know the the cost of everything and the value of nothing um, and and a free tool that won't work is no bargain um, so you know you, you can get in a situation where the the tool choice has been constrained and the vendor testing service provider is stuck using a tool for whatever reason that isn't going to work um, and and that's that's going to create problems, and these problems can be a little harder to recognize and resolve than they would if the client were creating the, the tests in house. Because the the vendor, you know, once you once you've engaged the vendor, they are going to be strongly motivated to um, at least try to carry through on everything that they promise to do. Because otherwise, you know, there goes the engagement, right? So. Um, what can happen is that some of the more some of the typical symptoms of test automation failure get disguised in these situations uh, until um, things get um, uh, th things have reached an impasse and, and, and uh, you know deliverables and deadlines have already been uh, affected. Now these these um, cautions apply not only to uh, um, initial selection but also to the issue of, of, of switching. Right? I mean, if you you do decide to switch for whatever reason. That's that might be the right thing to do, but you know, rectifying a bad tool choice after the the tool usage has already begun is not without cost. You know, there's the issues of, of migrating the work that has already been done to the new tool. There's a, a re ramp up, basically learning curve again on the, on the new tool. And you might be in a situation where that's um, not just an immediate term, but it's sort of a longer term because um, nobody on the team knows the tool. So if, you're, if there's going to be automation and you're going to use outsourcing to help with your automation, be really careful about this because this is, uh, uh, this is sort of one of these hidden, uh, hidden rocks that a lot of uh, uh, clients have stubbed their toe on pretty hard. Now, security issues. Um, in some cases, you know, there isn't any intellectual property, there isn't any data to worry about for whatever reason, and this is a non-issue. But really, more and more what we see with clients is that there's, there are security issues associated with the data. For example, there's personal identifying information in their production data. There's um, intellectual property issues. Um, you, you, know, you can't let the code out of the building for whatever reason because there are trade secrets in it. So, both sides of the uh, relationship, vendor and client, need to pay attention to these kinds of issues at the outset and and on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, certainly, some some very common mistakes that we've seen with our clients is um, not realizing that there are going to be issues in getting the test data, and assuming you're going to be able to use production data from the data center to do testing off-site. And then what happens is the um, chief security officer at the company, bank, insurance company, whatever the client is, hears about this and says, what, are you crazy? You're going to let the data off-site? No, you're not. When then test manager or director of testing, whatever, comes back and says, well, we'll just VPN them in. And they'll say, no, you're not going to do that either because the data is still appearing on screens. It's off-site. 
and um, you can't uh, you can't manage that. So you know this is um, this ends up being a uh, a real problem in some cases a a actual um, engagement torpedoing problem. So make sure that you've thought through that. Uh, if you are going to use VPN, make sure that you are VPN or some other way of accessing the, the client's network uh, from the vendor side. Make sure that that's, that's thought through in advance. We've, we've seen this with a number of clients turn out to be tremendously more complicated than one would have thought. Um, on the vendor side, make sure that you ask about HR procedures. Um, you know, are there uh, citizenship requirements? I mean, we have a we're working on a, a engagement with a client right now, trying to get it off the ground. And, and uh, initially, we thought we were going to be able to do this at our outsourced facility. And then they said, "Oh no, uh, all of the work has to be done by by uh, U.S. citizens or permanent residents. That's just the way it goes." Um, so you know, you want to discover that kind of stuff. Uh, security clearances, uh, you know, whatever whatever is going to come up. I had a, one of the more unusual um, eight client HR. Um, issues to arise once it was that myself and one of my associates who were working on this engagement for a client and a pretty high-end engagement were actually required to uh, submit uh, drug test samples uh, to uh, ensure that we were not using illegal drugs um, which I have to say was one of one of the more unique deliverables I've ever had on a project um, but so the, you know understand that these things can come up because some people might some some uh, people in your on the vendor side, might take umbrage at this, or it might be there might be issues associated with it of one kind or another. So, all these things need to be understood. Any other sort of special requirements that exist, you know, think about these things in advance. It's, it's usually easier to deal with things in um, in the event when you plan for them in advance. And then um, geographical and language issues. Um, not everybody needs to be able to communicate with everyone on the project team. I've, I've um, seen this work. I mean, we've had situations where we had testing that was going on in the United States and in Taiwan, for example. And you know, most of the Taiwanese testers could not speak English. Um, they were they were working in, in um, you know Mandarin Chinese. Um, but the key people who uh, were interfacing between the um, vendor and the client side. We're, we're able to communicate effectively. And that's, that's really what's important. Now, of course, it's best when everybody speaks the same language. But I think in this increasingly globalized world, that's becoming a more and more unrealistic uh, expectation. And you, you can't, I, I don't think it makes sense for, for clients to say, we are absolutely not going to have uh, people working on our projects that don't speak the um, dominant project language, whatever that is. Now, of course, some some situations, like for example, Germany does a fair amount of outsourcing, and obviously the Germans, the Germans know that they have to expect that um, the, the, the while the dominant project language is is going to be German on their side, that uh, you know the communication between them and say the Chinese subcontractors or vendors is going to be in English, which is neither of their uh, primary languages, but it's the language they have in common. Um, you know, I think it's it's more in the United States, Canada, the UK, so forth. Uh, English-speaking countries where we make this assumption of well, this isn't going to work unless everybody speaks English. Um, not, it's not necessarily true, but it does it, to the extent that people are not going to all be speaking English. Make sure that you've thought about how you're going to manage that. Also, there are um, you know there are of course time differences, um, and uh, you know you have to think about that. Now, now to some extent. The, the time differences can work in your advantage because you can say, well, we've got work going on on this project pretty much continuously. But you know, I think it, it, it's important to be realistic about that. Um, anytime any sort of problem comes up and there needs to be discussion about how best to solve the problem, people are working in a, in a situation where the times, time zones are not, not overlapping, or at least only, only partially overlapping. That slows down the decision-making process and, and reduces your agility. So, you know, on projects that go very smoothly and can be pre-planned, this is less of an issue. On projects that have to respond on a regular basis, hourly or daily basis to changes in priorities, this is going to create, um, uh, create some potential issues and you need to think about how to handle it. You also need to think about holiday calendars. I mean, different cultures have different holidays 
And it's very difficult to know, uh, unless you deal with this in advance, the, the significance of a particular holiday. I mean, you can look at you can look at a calendar that might pop up the different holidays and say would exist in India or China or something like that. But um, you know, what's the relative importance? I mean, in the United States, for example, New Year's, you know, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day is kind of this sort of guilty um, guilty pleasure in a lot of ways. It's you know, it's a dissipated kind of event, and um, it doesn't involve family very much. It's not taken very serious. It's very it's a very frivolous kind of thing for most people. Chinese New Year, on the other hand, is this big, you know, week-long family get-together, major cultural event, and so you know, you you can't just say, okay, well, their New Year's, our New Year's, what the heck, you know, we work through New Year's, and you know, we expect them to work through New Year's. That that's just simply not going to work. So you need to understand that because when these issues are not managed properly, they can lead to a lot of uh, frustration and communication problems. And then um, final on our list here of uh, planning and estimation blunders. I mean, it is a lot of outsourced testing project failures do begin in the planning stages. Um, so you know, you, you the, the the old saying, you know, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. That the plan is completely pointed in the wrong direction, the estimate is is bad. Then your outcomes are things like you know, the the client doesn't get the job done on time with the right level of quality. Um, or the testing service provider ends up losing money on the deal, or both. Everybody's unhappy, and a lot of this just comes out of you know underestimation or or um, bad planning. So make sure that you deal with uh, deal with planning and estimation properly. Avoid things like unidentified requirements um, that that cause gaps in the plan where. You're like, oh, I, we didn't know we needed to do that, so we we're not ready to do that, and now we've got to scramble to try to do that. Assumptions about stakeholder involvement and commitment. I mean, if the if the outsource vendor is assuming that they'll be able to get somebody on the phone uh, to walk them through, say, troubleshooting bugs that come up, and the and the, on the client side, they're going, no, we just want to throw this testing over the fence and get it done. Then you know that's a major mismatch. Of course, any any form of underestimation of the effort involved on on either side of the relationship in any area um, is is going to result in in overruns and profitability issues, efficiency issues, uh, missed deadlines and so forth, so that's bad. And also, you know, try not to, to build in no buffer at all, no no um, no contingency, because that's that's another classic way to fail. If you assume everything is gonna take just exactly as long as it should take, you're basically assuming that no screw ups occur. And that's just not not real realistic in software engineering projects. We make mistakes as software engineers and we need to be ready to deal with them. Okay, so some conclusions here. Uh, outsource testing can benefit both the, the vendor and the client. And uh, you know, should it should and should only be done when it will uh, benefit them. So to to achieve that, make sure that both parties are, are aware of and are managing the risks, both the risks that affect them and the risks that affect the folks on the other side of the relationship. Don't risk is not a bad word. Um, risk is a, is a word that we should embrace and we should help manage. Make sure that everything is mutually understood, um, that processes, constraints, expected results, and so forth are all agreed in advance. Uh, make sure that everybody's motivations, abilities, and expectations are clear and that there isn't any attempt to try to hoodwink. Uh, the other side, and um, you know, both sides should exercise due diligence and enter into the relationship in a in a fully informed fashion, and insist on a relationship that is indeed mutually beneficial. So, um, wind this uh, down and go into Q and A. Before I do that, I'd like to thank my uh, co-authors on the source material, Ashish uh, Usman and uh, Andy Sondanigam. I'll. Uh, Put the uh, advertisement up here as usual, and uh, that concludes the presentation. At this point, I'll answer questions from the audience. Uh, please submit any questions that you have using the uh, webinar Q and A feature. Uh, let me um, undock the uh, question pane, and uh, pardon me for just a moment. It's always always a little bit clunky here on the question and answer pane in the uh, go to webinar um, 
Okay, let's see. I get a, I see we've got a report from Bill Bennett uh, that he had a problem with voice over IP. Um, uh, it went down. Sorry that you had that problem. If sounds like he thinks that this is only his site, but you know, if you do, and if any of you do have problems with the audio or visual uh, elements of this during the presentation, I'm always happy to hear uh, problem reports afterwards. And if, if it does look like it's systemic, we we certainly will follow it up with go to webinar. So please do feel free to uh, do that. Um, Let's see, we got a question for, from uh, Virginia. Uh, please comment on off-site staff augmentation. Thanks. Um, okay. Well, Virginia, let me see if I get, get what you mean by that properly. So by, by on-site staff augmentation, I would mean that these are people who are assigned to um, do the work at the client site, and basically they work as um, as subcontractors. They're you know they're they're basically there working uh, primarily under the direction of the client. Uh, this, this can range from the pure what's sometimes called body shop arrangements, where it's just you're just renting somebody and they bring no special expertise to the the engagement, and there's no real parameters around the engagement other than here's how much they're going to get paid. All the way to um, you know more structured kind of thing where somebody's working on site and they're there to do a very specific task, and um, you know while they they might work to some extent at the direction of the client, they would not um, they would not engage in jobs that would be completely out of out of scope for what they would do. Now, outsourced testing service providers at the total under end of the spectrum is highly constrained or typically highly constrained kind of thing. Is that the the job that they're to do, the testing work that they're to do, has been predefined up front uh, in some sort of um, statement of work or engagement parameters. Now, certainly that can change over time. And, and I, in fact, the contractual issues I was talking about, time and materials versus um, versus a, a fixed bid. Um, <clears throat> but I guess what you're alluding to here, Virginia, is that there is a um, middle piece there where we could have people working off-site um, using things like uh, virtualization and uh, virtual private networks and, and, and other types of uh, technology that allows them to work remotely. And they're basically functioning as, the, as kind of a, almost a work-at-home contractor or work-at-home employee. Um, now, now, certainly, you know that that's something that can happen. We've seen that to some extent. Um, the you know the usual caveats of having people work off-site apply as well as do the usual benefits. Um, you know, you're not you're not providing office space. So the the um, cost of having that person around is is reduced. Um, but on the other hand, if they are not self-directed types of people then they might end up um, not being very efficient. They might end up getting distracted and squandering time on things that aren't actually work. So I'd say if, if you've got resources that are not working at your site, nor are they under direct supervision and management at, the, at whatever site they are working at, then you want to be pretty careful about, about managing that. And, and you know, as people come into that relationship, you want to monitor their productivity very carefully uh, to make sure that they're not um, uh, slacking off, basically, and dropping work. Um, so uh, I've got a question from Michelle here. I can't find this slide set on the RBCS site. Can you point me to a specific URL or place on the site? So what you want to do is go to rbcs-us.com. And across the top there, you'll see a resources um, Tab, kind of in the in the, the middle of the, the upper third of the uh, of the page, and then when you click on that, what's going to come to, and there's going to drop down menu is going to come down from that, or you point at it anyway, and then so you go to the basic library and select the basic library, and you'll um, you'll find the slides there. Um, okay, a question from Manoj. Is it possible not to get affected by client as only testing is outsourced, but the other areas are still managed by client, um, such as infrastructure, supporting test environments, approval of test cases? Yeah, okay, that's 
that's a, that's an important point. And you know, if you're on the on the vendor side of the testing service provider relationship, you do want to be very careful about these kinds of things if you're reliant on the client to provide them. Um, we had an experience once, which I, I, I am not by any means suggesting is typical. Um, we had a client, and we were working on a project. Uh, we were working at, at their site, so this was a form of staff augmentation that was really, it was really closer to the testing service providers because we were we were managing the, the the testers directly and interfacing with the client. But we were reliant on on their test environments, and for the most part, that went okay. But there was one group that was administering one part of the test environment, a legacy system that we needed to compare our actual test results against because the, the new system was being built up to replace this legacy system and correct results were often defined in terms of what the legacy system did. And uh, what we found was that the during test execution, the legacy system would be brought down for quote unquote routine maintenance at arbitrary intervals that was seemed almost calculated to be to maximize the disruption that it caused on test execution and there would be no communication of that. So we would be blocked in testing for half an hour wondering what was going on and then we would find out, oh, well the, the back end legacy system is down. Um, and in spite of repeated uh, requests that they give us ample notice before that happens, they refuse to do it. Now, that, you know, I just had to go to the client contact and say, I can't tell you how long it's going to take to test because I can't tell you when our, our dependencies are going to be satisfied to run the tests. And until you can get these people at the other end to stop doing what they're doing, I don't know how to deal with this. And that ended up creating an enormous political problem. So if you are going to be in a situation where you are dependent on the client to provide uh, this kind of support, uh, infrastructure, test environments, approval of test cases, and so forth, make sure you've got SLAs in your contract. And this is not just like so you can stick it to the client. I mean, this is to the client's benefit as well. This gets back to everybody has clear expectations about what's supposed to happen. A uh, question from Alicia here. Uh, is it reasonable to expect off-site workers, um, and it says here it says in India, to follow scrum agile processes that are being followed internally? Have you ever seen it occur successfully? Well. Let's generalize this and say, is it reasonable to expect off-site workers anywhere to uh, follow uh, Scrum um, processes, and, and can that work? Um, it is indeed a challenge. I mean, you know, one of the things, if you, if you look at Agile, Agile principles, you go out to this, you know, agilemanifesto.org or whatever that website is it's to find the basic Agile principles of Agile. You know, one of the things that it says is it, that, that uh, Agile um, practitioners are supposed to value face-to-face -face communications over documentation. Um, documentation presumably would mean emails and, and other written forms of communication as well. Now, the problem is that as you get into a distributed work situation, it becomes harder and harder to have face-to-face -face communication. Um, one of Tom DeMarco's books, I can't remember which one it was, it might have been People Wear, it might have been one of the other ones, it talked about some study that had been done where they looked at how dramatically face-to-face -face communication dropped off as you moved people away from each other. So if, if everybody's sitting around in a, in a shared cubicle area or some kind of you know bullpen type of arrangement where everyone can see everyone, there's a lot of face-to-face -face communication. Now that can be that could be both good and bad. Um, we're not, uh, not going to get into that all, all the complexities of that, but certainly face-to-face -face communication is maximized when everybody's right next to everybody else. As you start to move people away from each other, even on the same floor, the communication, face-to-face -face communication drops off dramatically. And when you get to a situation where people are separated by one or more floors on the building, it drops off even more. So, you know, imagine what happens as you get people, you know, they're across town and and then you throw in the whole um, time zone separation problem that says that, well, guess what? There's now non-overlapping non, non windows of time where people are working, where they basically cannot communicate with each other. Or they, the communication will be um, in some way disfavored. You know, I mean, certainly everybody's used to carrying around a cell phone now, and so 
you're on an important project, your cell phone rings at 10 o'clock at night, and it's somebody who's working on something in, say, India or China or whatever, you can assume that you're going to take the call and you're going to um, try to deal with it. And, you know, there are some people who who are born firefighters and they like this kind of thing. It's like, ooh, I must be important. My phone's ringing in the middle of the night. But most people with real lives, they get they get pretty burnt out on that pretty quickly. So it is it is you know disfavored. And certainly, you you would not want to have to get pulled into on, on a regular ongoing basis some sort of standing conference call slash scrum meeting that was done by phone at or or webinar or something at ten o'clock at night your your local time. So I think you've um, you've you've got to manage this very carefully in order to make this work. It's not. It's not going to scale just directly as it is. Um, you know, various things that we have seen work do include things like having people who are primary points of contact and, and dividing up the work in a way such that you know there's certain work that can be done asynchronously, such as automating of test cases and so forth, and that's what gets farmed out. So there are different um, there are different ways that you can handle this, but it, it's not it's not going to scale just you know you throw it over the fence and, and everything works. Um, we got a uh, um, a question from Bill here. What are the different SLAs you can call out in a contract? For example, number of test scripts executed, number of test script steps executed, number of applications, number of interfaces, others. Hmm. Good question, Bill. Um, One of the things that, of course, you do have to be careful of with any sort of metrics of engagement success is uh, you know, the, the old management uh, rule of thumb that what gets measured gets done, and conversely, what, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. And so you have to be very careful as you're putting together these SLAs on, on these various things that you do have um, some thought about what kind of behavior is going to come out of that, and um, is that positive or negative? Um, you know, I mean, the most extreme example that I can think of is that there are some um, outsource testing organizations that will that will uh, basically, you know, charge by the test case executed or by the bug found. Now, you know, let's take the test case executed example. I mean, um, the the test that runs the fastest is the one that passes. So you're basically incenting people to not report bugs unless it's really obvious. And on the other hand, if you're paying by the bug found, then you know what you're what you're saying is anything, even the most trivial issue, is going to result in a bug report. So, you know, I, I think this is an area that you have to be really careful with. You have to try to balance the um, balance the metrics so that they are aligned with the kind of behavior that you want. And um, you know basically what you, what you do, you know, look at the objectives that you have for the engagement. And try to think about okay, well, what what would, from an effectiveness and efficiency point of view, what what, what do we want to uh, to do to achieve in terms of those objectives, and then try to derive some metrics from those. Um, I think all too often what happens is that we start from the bottom up with metrics and go, oh, well, look, I can measure this, I can measure this, I can measure this. Well, just because you can measure something doesn't mean that 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 measuring it and managing by that measurement is going to have a positive outcome. In some cases, it can have a very negative outcome. Um, I have a report here that says the basic library does not list today's slides. Now this is um, the test uh, uh, 10, 10 lessons in test outsourcing, um, and uh, you know that's I, I would hope that you could find them there. I will uh, ask that uh, that that be double checked by my end, and uh, we'll be sure that the uh, they, they are there. Okay, I've just got confirmation that they are there. They are on the basic library page the uh, testing resources tab. So um, please look again. That's uh, 10 uh, uh, lessons in, uh, in test outsourcing. Um, let's see. Uh, the question here about the PDUs. Um, the way that the PDU um, stuff works for, for uh, webinars that are PDU eligible which uh, I believe this one is, is that you, as a, as an attendee, you will get an email um, that 
basically thanks you for your attendance and participation and also gives you the information you need to, uh, to claim the PDUs. So that's how that process works. We need to make sure that it's done that way rather than giving out the information directly because we are recording this and we will post this in the digital library. And the uh, um, problem with that is that somebody could listen to it and hear the PDU code and, and use it. And, and um, while we don't have a problem with that, PMI has said that no, only those people who actually attend the webinar uh, are, are eligible to get PDU. So this is it's PMI's regulation on this, I'm afraid, not, not ours. Um, so that information should be available to you shortly, Bill. Um, uh, Bill says, thanks, excellent presentation. Thank you, Bill, appreciate that. I hope to see you again at uh, future presentations. And uh, if you have any ideas on things that you'd like to see us cover in future presentations, feel free to send those. We're, we're working on the next uh, group of webinars here over the next uh, couple of weeks. We want to get our schedule planned out through August, September timeframe. So ideas are welcome. Um, I got an email here from uh, one of my uh, uh, co-authors of the material here, uh, Andy. Hey, Andy, good to hear from you. I hope you're doing well up there, and uh, you're in Toronto, I believe now. Um, he says, this presentation is mainly from the testing service provider's perspective. This could have a client's perspective as well, meaning the same lessons might have slightly different solutions. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, as I went along, Andy, I was trying to present, I was trying to be clear which side of this I was looking at it from, and while the, while it is true that the, the base materials were um, certainly very much uh, testing service provider focused or, or perspective. Um, what I really tried to do during the presentation, and I hope it came out, is to, to, um, to see it from both sides and to really take the client side in the, in the um, I wouldn't say in the forefront, but, but into, into uh, you know, uh, great consideration. I mean, because ultimately the business is being given out by the client, and, you know, as the the cliche goes, the customer is always right. Um, so uh, I've, I've certainly been involved in test outsourcing on both sides of the relationship, both as the service provider and also as a, um, you know, the, an employee or, or consultant to companies that were hiring service providers. And so I've seen this really from the 360 degree perspective. And, you know, as long as we all on all sides of the relationship work together to achieve a common Common goal, common success. Then you know these things. These things work um, work well. These relationships. And it's only when we get into situations where the um, where we're not all pointed in the same direction, trying to achieve the same things, that we we tend to see um, problems. Um, you know the, the 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 testing service providers. I guess what I'm trying to say is the testing service providers' perspective and the client's perspective should not be widely divergent in most cases unless there's something dysfunctional in the relationship and that's where the divergence really comes about so you know if you're if you're finding on either side of the relationship that your business interests are completely different than the business interests of the person on the other side of the relationship there, there's just something wrong with the relationship and a lot of times that goes back to the contract as we mentioned before okay got a um, comment from Solusia. Great webinar, Rex. Looking forward to attending more in the future. Great. Good to hear from that. We'll uh, be sending out an invite for the next one, the March one, here shortly. It is going to move. It was previously scheduled for March 3rd, I believe, and it turns out that I'm actually going to be in Shanghai uh, that week. So that's not a that's not a real good good time for me to try to do a webinar. Um, so we're going we're gonna to move that around somewhat, but there will be one uh, in March and and again in April and so forth. We, we do these things monthly and of course they're always always free and not only are they free but actually we always have the uh, the uh, free e-learning drawing that happens and um, if, if those of you who've attended uh, rather than people listening to the recorded version of this you'll be um, some lucky winner will be getting notification that they are the, uh, the winner of the free e-learning so watch for that. Um, okay so that seems to have uh, wound up the uh, the questions. Um, so um, I would uh, you know, thank you all for your uh, your participation, and that's always good to get a lot of questions. Uh, so to close this session, let me tell you a little bit more about the uh, resources available through RBCS. As I said, we run these free uh, webinar sessions once a month. So check our website, rbcs-us.com. Uh, if you um, 
like a, a special webinar presentation for your company only of this webinar or on any other topic related to software testing, you can contact us at info at rbcs-us.com or via our website. If you don't already receive our regular free newsletter, you can sign up at rbcs-us.com. By signing up, you'll get valuable discounts on consulting and training services, along with a regular newsletter that includes a featured article on software testing and quality, and news about what RBCS and its partners are doing lately. You can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash rbcs, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash pages slash rbcs-inc. Uh, remember to check your email over the next couple days. You might be the uh, winner of free e-learning, as I said. You were registered simply by attending. Uh, check out our digital library. There are recordings of these webinars, podcasts, and videos. Um, you can subscribe to podcasts uh, via iTunes by entering RBCS Podcasts into the search string. And you can see videos and recorded podcasts on YouTube by subscribing to the RBCS channel. And then finally, there's the, RB, the, the blog, um, my blog on the RBCS website. It's a good way to get in touch with me, discuss any of the issues that were brought up in this webinar or that's been brought up in, our, in uh, my books and so forth. Uh, and in fact, if you are reading one of my books and you have questions about it, we have a special mechanism. That I answer one question a week about a topic in the book. Um, you can read at the blog site how to submit your question or discussion point, and I'll be happy to, to do that. These are all free resources, and we offer these free re resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS, we're a not just for profit company. That concludes the webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining today and uh, wish you all a uh, pleasant uh, rest of the day. <laughs>